biology is the scientific study of life, what is science? Science is all about gathering knowledge about the natural world through observation and experimentation. Science, like politics ugh, and the arts, is a social enterprise. However, its approach is far more objective. See, all humans have a worldview, which is how we each perceive the world around us. This worldview is shaped by our morals, values, thinking, religious and or spiritual beliefs, or simply what we can observe with our five senses. In order to perform science, one must be able to reduce the bias as much as possible and accept that scrutiny is a healthy and viable part of seeking the truth in nature. Not that scientists lack a worldview, it's just they realize that the pursuit of knowledge requires one to reduce subjectivity and thus reduce the impact their worldview has on that endeavor. Science is performed for the betterment of humanity, but some science is simply done out of curiosity. Understanding the secrets of nature requires a vast imagination and creativity to experiment and carefully observe. So science is all about how we gather knowledge about the natural world, but it is limited. Science cannot answer moral or ethical questions about whether or not God exists, or even things of aesthetic quality. For example, the phrase, I love my wife, although that is true, cannot be measured and cannot be disproven, and in no way ever be scientifically tested. That's because moral questions, the existence of God, or my love of my wife, are outside of the physical or material realm. None of these things are made of matter or energy, and thus cannot be observed or measured. For something to be scientific, it must be measurable and falsifiable. To be measurable means that you can sense it with your own nervous system, However, things like ultraviolet radiation and microorganisms cannot be seen with our own senses. Therefore, we use devices to allow us to detect things we cannot see. Falsifiability is the ability to disprove something. This may sound odd, but you can't really prove anything. Proving requires, one, to be correct in all circumstances imaginable. This includes space and time. However, one piece of credible evidence is enough to disprove something. The idea was made famous by science philosopher Karl Popper. One famous example lies in the phrase, all swans are white. You can disprove this statement by simply finding an example of a non-white swan. In fact, before Europeans colonized Australia, it was thought that all swans were white. But in Australia, a black swan does actually exist. Therefore, you falsified the statement by simply finding that black swan. If a statement said all life is made of cells, this is still falsifiable. It has, to date, not been disproven. In fact, the more you fail to disprove something, the more likely the information is true. The fact that we continually fail to disprove that all life is made up of cells allows us to make predictions that any new life form discovered will also, in fact, be made of cells. However, we can never prove this statement because we only know about life on Earth. If a life form was found that was not made up of cells, so what do you do? Well, you actually tweak the statement based on this new data. In fact, scientific knowledge changes with better evidence. And yes, science knowledge does change because science is a self-correcting system designed to get closer to the truth of nature. So how is science performed? Many of you learned a scientific method in school, and this multi-step process helps scientists frame a question, design a hypothesis to pursue the answer, and observe or experiment to get those answers, and then finally form some kind of conclusion. Please know that the scientific method is not the only way to perform science. It is impossible to experiment on planetary systems or tectonic shifts. It can also be unethical to perform various experiments. And sometimes, scientists simply want to observe nature for what it is without having to add or take away any of these variables. Nevertheless, the scientific method is useful in many cases. It starts off with an observation, then a question, then a development of a hypothesis, and in some cases, a prediction. Then an experiment is designed, followed by the analysis of results, and then a conclusion is drawn. Hypotheses are tentative explanations to a question asked. The purpose of a hypothesis is to help design an experiment to test the explanation. The if-then statements you might have learned in grade school are more geared towards a prediction. 
Predictions are answers to a hypothesis based on the parameters set by your experiment. Scientific theories are generally accepted, thoroughly tested and confirmed explanations for a set of observations or phenomena. This is much different than what the public thinks of when they hear the word theory. To them, theory is more like a hypothesis or just a wow guess. Facts are statements that are verified with evidence. However, facts are not absolute. If better evidence comes along, a fact can be changed or completely disregarded altogether, thanks to the scientific method. Think of theories as an umbrella of facts. Cell theory answers questions related to the structure and function of cells, and evolutionary theory answers questions related to species relatedness, adaptations, and why changes occur. So why did the science change so much during the COVID-19 pandemic? Because you were literally living through the scientific method. Ideas about how to mitigate spread were based on other coronaviruses at that time, it wasn't until careful experimentation that we finally learned that the virus spread by the air, that masking reduced that same spread, and that the vaccine prevented severe hospitalization and death. Like it or not, science changed because of, well, science. Better and more consistent data develop over different groups of people using the same standards, and a more solidified answer was eventually found. So let's use an example of the science with the scientific method. Let's say that you have always performed better on a test because you wore your lucky red shirt. Taking this observation, you might ask, does wearing a red shirt help me perform best on an exam? I know this sounds silly, but shirt color and test scores implies both measurability and falsifiability. From there, you form a hypothesis. You can either say wearing red improves test scores or shirt color has no bearing on test scores. Either way, the experimental design will be based on your hypothesis. In fact, experimental design is where the science gets creative and somewhat crazy. In order to perform an experiment, you need to identify your variables or any portion of the experiment that can vary or change in the experiment overall. First, you will need to split your experiment into an experimental and control group. The experimental group receives the special treatment while the control group does not. Since a hypothesis states that red shirts will improve test scores, the experimental group is the red shirts, while the control is any other color. A control group is necessary to ensure that it is, in fact, shirt color and not another factor that causes test scores to increase. Your independent variable is the variable that is changed amongst groups, in this case, red versus non-red shirts. Your dependent variable is the variable that is measured amongst the different groups, in this case, your test scores. Control variables are those that are kept the same amongst all groups. In other words, each group gets the same exam, they're found in the same room, and they use similar writing instruments. You must also consider factors or aspects of the experiment outside of the experimenter's control. These include the amount of study time or whether students ate or even slept before an exam. Finally, this brings me to sample size. It's really important in an experiment to have a large sample size as to reduce the effects of factors on the experiment. For example, if you have a group of 10 people, five red versus five non-red, and one person did not sleep the night before, it may skew the results, making one conclude that shirts and not lack of sleep affected test scores. If you have 100 people and one person had a lack of sleep, this will less likely affect those test scores. Now, imagine that there are many, many multiple people in each particular group. So a few other things to consider when designing an experiment are placebo effect and blindness. Placebo effect occurs when an individual reacts to a placebo or a substance or method with no intended effect. Usually this is given to the control group. In order to reduce the placebo effect, the researcher will need to institute blindness. A single blind study occurs when the participants are unaware of which group they are in while a double-blind includes both the participants and researchers being unaware. Typically, a researcher hires a neutral third party to administer the experiment. Without blindness, it is possible that conclusions are misinterpreted because of plain old human psychology and not the actual substance or method. Such as this person being picked to wear a red shirt might actually believe they will do better because they were selected for that group. 
Blindness is not required for all scientific studies, but when studying medicine or psychology, randomized double-blind studies are the gold standard. So going back to the shirt experiment, to make this double-blind, the researcher needs to leave the room and have an assistant pass out the shirts for the students to wear while taking the test. However, the test has to be taken in a darker room with desk lights used to take the exams. This prevents the researcher from identifying the participants and the students from knowing which group that they are in. Regardless, results are then collected and a conclusion is drawn. So if in fact red shirts are shown to provide a great advantage, can one make it a fact? No. The experiment needs to be replicated by others to see if they get similar results. If they don't, the original experimental conclusion is called into question. Case in point, I hypothesize that shirt color really has no bearing on test scores. Beyond formal education, most people benefit from the products made by the scientific process, such as medications, digital technology, and foods. So what use is science? Well, see, science is divided into basic or applied. Basic science, or pure science, is all about learning for the sake of learning regardless of any use that learning may provide. However, basic science is the first step towards applied science, which is finding applications to scientific ideas that can be used by the public as a whole. Ever had a PCR COVID test done? PCR stands for polymerase chain reaction, which is basically a way to amplify or make multiple copies of genetic material. In this case, a PCR test is trying to determine if you have the genetic material for SARS-CoV-2, the cause of COVID-19. This test is an applied science that could not have happened without the discovery of this obscure microorganism found only in the hot springs of Yellowstone National Park. The basic science would simply celebrate the discovery of this microorganism. However, without its discovery, TAC polymerase, an important enzyme made by this organism, would not have been found. TAC polymerase can tolerate extremely high temperatures, and since this enzyme is found in the microorganism that is also in hot temperatures, we can use this to perform PCR. PCR requires high temperatures, and therefore COVID-19 tests can be performed much faster. Another example is the Human Genome Project, which is a major initiative that took place in the late 90s to map out the entire human genome. This could not have happened without performing basic science on genome mapping or other, of other organisms. Once the genome was fully mapped for people by 2003, scientists were now able to apply this research to help find cures for genetic diseases. So on the surface, it appears as if basic science is useless and applied science is useful, but applied science cannot happen without the foundational knowledge of some person who is simply just curious about the world around them. So how is scientific work reported to other scientists and the public? Scientists utilize a process called peer review. In this process, a scientist, let's say a fish biologist, writes the results of a study they did on paddlefish. In order to ensure that the results of the study are sound, other fish biologists are asked to review the work of the author to ensure that the data and methods meet the established parameters practiced by fish biologists worldwide. It's also a chance for other fish biologists to challenge these findings and allow the author to defend their work. This process is tedious, but necessary, as without peer review, people can just make up whatever bull they want. Looking at you, supplement industry. Scientists also communicate with each other by forums, physical or online conferences, poster presentations, and oral presentations. The purpose of peer review work is not only to educate people of your findings, but to give other scientists a chance to replicate your findings. If different people perform the same study and get similar results, you get closer to a truth about nature. The general public is not privy to much of peer review research because these conferences and articles are all written by and for fellow scientists in the same field. Therefore, the general public relies on secondary literature such as popular science magazines, TV shows, and good science educators. If you ever wish to research and publish scientific data, always use peer review research. Anything else is not guaranteed to be reliable. In our next chapter, we will begin our journey for life. However, we must start at the most basic form of matter, atoms and molecules.